So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about informed consent, a common everyday practice um, when we're uh, taking care of patients. Now, people will generally think about informed consent when you're thinking about a surgeon bringing a patient to the operating room, or a proceduralist like an interventional radiologist or gastroenterologist uh, taking the patient for a procedure. But it happens every day when we're prescribing medications to a patient. So I'm in internal medicine, and you know, a common practice for me is you know, taking care of patients with hypertension. So if I've diagnosed somebody with hypertension, I need to prescribe an antihypertensive medication. Uh, I'm going to need to go through with them uh, this informed consent process. So I need to explain the rationale for why I think it's important to treat their hypertension, to hopefully prevent you know, them having heart attacks or strokes in the future. You know, understand the, the natural history of hypertension and what it can do to the body. Um, why I'm proposing a medication for them. I might, you know, also, you know, recommend lifestyle modification. You know, restricting their uh, sodium intake, uh, getting more physically active, stopping smoking. You know, various things that um, might be needed to help manage their hypertension. But if I think they need medication, then I need to go through what are the benefits of taking a medication. You know, gets their blood pressure under better control. What are the potential risks of, you know, the medication I'm prescribing? If I'm going to prescribe an ACE inhibitor, I might need to tell them that I have to monitor their kidney function or their potassium level. 15% um, of people might have a cough associated with use of an ACE inhibitor, so I might need to forewarn the patient that they might experience a tickle in the throat and get a cough. They should let me know about that if it becomes a nuisance. If it's a 35-year-old woman that uh, is potentially wanting to get pregnant one day, um, I might need to, you know, factor in that if she wants to become pregnant, there might be iatrogenic uh, effects, you know, prenatally uh, to a fetus from use of an ACE inhibitor. So that would be an instance where maybe that's right, not the right medication choice uh, for her. So I'd need to walk through, um, are there other options, are there all other alternative medications that we might choose that would be best suited uh, for that particular patient? So all of these sort of have to be uh, considered in the everyday practice of medicine. So this lecture is going to be talking about the informed consent process. So uh, the first point to make is uh, while we commonly refer to it as informed consent, it's really informed decision making. So uh, you know, thinking back to um, other lectures where we talked about respect for autonomy, uh, there's also the option that the patient could say no. It's uh, a refusal uh, of making uh, that treatment decision whatever we might be recommending. So uh, they have the right to either consent or to refuse the proposed treatment. So it's really their decision. So why is this important? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I as a physician, a doctor, uh, you know, the root of the, the term doctor is docere, which means to teach. So I would say one of the, the core elements of my role as a physician is to teach my patient about their health, about their condition, what's going on in their body. Um, if I'm proposing a treatment, I have to teach them about that treatment. So uh, it goes along with being a teacher uh, to the patient. The other reason that it's important is, you know, just communication. So the exchange of information starts at the very first time I meet with the patient. So that initial encounter where they're uh, describing their symptoms and I'm, you know, uh, exploring it, trying to understand what they've been going through, trying to come up with a diagnosis, that back and forth of exchange of information is really a means of getting eventually to an informed consent of um, I make an assessment of what's going on with them and then I'm going to recommend a treatment. So ongoing communication with the patient is, is critical. The reason to do informed consent is also to show respect for the patient. So. I respect them enough to, to want to give them the information so that they can be self-determining, that they can make their own decisions. Uh, and my means of uh, explanation uh, is really a sign of respect for them and that I value uh, their input. It's also important that the patient feels that they can trust us. So if I'm hiding information or not disclosing things that are going to be relevant uh, to their health or to their health care, uh, then there may be, you know, issues of distrust. So this is really a means of building trust with the patient. I'm being forthcoming, uh, explaining things, hopefully in understandable terms, uh, and that's a means of building trust that they can then say, yes, I want to work with this clinician, um, you know, to take care of me. 
And that also then is not only trust, but builds a relationship. So the back and forth exchange of information, the communication uh, that's going on uh, is a means of building that clinician-patient relationship, which is then going to, you know, uh, see you through, you know, into the future as you assess how the treatment is working, whether you need to make modifications, and so on. So what are the elements of informed consent? Well, first of all, uh, there are preconditions. Even before you get to the consent process, you have to establish whether the patient is making decisions voluntarily and also that they have the capacity or the ability to make decisions. There's another lecture we're going to have about uh, assessing decision-making capacity, but for now, let's just say we, we need to make sure that the patient is making uh, decisions freely and that they have the ability to make those decisions. So we're going to start with that. We then have to go through um, information elements. So that's us disclosing information to the patient about the recommended treatment when we'll go through, you know, what are the requirements there, but also checking that they've understood that information. And then lastly, there are going to be consent elements. So um, when we've given the information, we have to then see if they make a decision. You know, are they going to say yes, consent to it, or say no, you know, refuse uh, that decision? So all of those things are going to be um, the elements of the informed consent process. All right, so let's look at uh, these elements uh, individually. Um, in another lecture, we're going to talk about the threshold elements, the voluntariness and the decision-making capacity. Uh, let's focus in now on the information elements. So there's a need to disclose information, obligation to disclose this information uh, to the patient so that they can render a judgment for themselves of whether or not to, to accept our, our treatment recommendation. So there have been various standards that have been uh, applied over the years in terms of how much information you need to give and the quality of that information. In the old days, there might have been the professional standard, which would say, well, in the community of physicians, let's say, uh, that professional standard would say this is what's commonly done in terms of the information elements that should be shared with the patient. That's evolved into the reasonable person standard. So what would the average person on the street, if you were going to propose a treatment to them, what do you think are the things that they would need to know that would be material to them making a decision? And that's generally the standard that we try to apply today, the reasonable person standard. There's also this subjective standard, which is you're taking the reasonable person standard, but now you're also um, knowing the elements about the patient and their life and what's important to them. Uh, and so you can be much more subjective in terms of how you share that information with the patient um, and re really enhance the reasonable person standard to make it applicable uh, to this particular person. All right, so what are the things you need to disclose? There are going to be a list of things, and we'll, we'll go through uh, each of these. First of all, you've made a diagnosis, so you have to tell the patient what their condition is, uh, what the nature of their condition is, what to expect, you know, what happened with the natural history of that condition. Um, so, you know, why you're proposing that it needs to be treated. Uh, that's going to then lead you into the indications for treatment. So if you don't treat your hypertension, your blood pressure could, you know, be very high, you could be at risk of strokes or heart attacks in the future, you know, the, the consequences of having high blood pressure. So trying to get your blood pressure under control, that's the indication for the treatment. What is the nature of the proposed treatment? You know, so in that case for hypertension, it's, you know, perhaps taking medications. There also could be, you know, behavioral things that the person could do, uh, and that might be part of your treatment, uh, you know, regimen proposal to the patient, but you have to describe the nature of the, the treatment. When it's a surgeon and they're suggesting, you know, an operation, they need to describe what the operation entails and, you know, what the patient would go through in terms of post-op recovery and so on. So, um, what you're suggesting as the, the remedy uh, for their condition through an operation. You also have to say, well, what are the chances of success that the proposed treatment will work or, or help to treat the, the condition? Um, and you're you know, perhaps recommending because you think it is going to have some chance of success, so you want to try to describe that probability. And again, you know, that goes along with the anticipated benefits of the proposed treatment. So why are you doing it, and what do you hope to achieve uh, through the treatment? You also need to describe what are going to be the risks. You know, those risks that are material uh, that could be of negative consequence uh, to the patient 
uh, if they actually you know, undertook the proposed treatment. Uh, so what are the risks of surgery? What are the risks of a medication? Um, things that might uh, have side effects uh, or adverse effects or chances of, you know, a complication. You know, we can't uh, uh, get away from complications in, in clinical medicine. That, that just comes with the territory. So you have to describe, based on the experience of, you know, other patients that have had this treatment or surgery or, or procedure, uh, what do you anticipate those risks to be? There may be things that are uncertain. That's also part of uh, the reality of clinical medicine. Uh, the uncertainties of, you know, things can happen uh, and the patient needs to be aware that, you know, we can't predict everything, but we need to be aware that uh, there are certain uncertainties uh, and we have to uh, share that. We also have to say, well, are there alternatives to what we are recommending? There may be, you know, let's not do any treatment um, and just follow the natural history of the disease. We've already talked about, you know, with the patient needs to know uh, what the potential downsides of that are. Uh, there may be other treatments that uh, might not be as uh, highly recommended as, as uh, what you're suggesting, um, but they might be alternatives and the patient might wish, wish to, to hear about those uh, and what the benefits and risk of those alternatives might be. And I do think it's important, you know, when it's the clinician uh, doing the informed consent process, that they should give a recommendation. So a layperson may not know enough. You know, you know some lay people will, you know, do their own uh, research and you know read up on things and and try to help uh, in figuring out uh, how to treat a condition. But in most cases, people are going to be relying on on the physician to give them a recommendation and, and why they think the recommendation is the the best option for them. So I think that's part of the elements of disclosure, um, that you give the recommendation, you give the alternatives, but why you think the recommendation is, is the best way to go. All right, so then you have to think about the patient perspective of these things. Um, so what are their, what's their role in this process? So first of all, you have to invite them to participate in the decision. Now that may mean that um, you know, there are some patients that don't want to get a lot of information, and we have to respect, you know, their choices in terms of the degree of information they wish to receive. When we've given the information, when we've disclosed it to them, we then have to assess their understanding or their comprehension of the information. So there may be strategies of what's called teach back, so asking them questions to see if they've understood the information, retained it, uh, and then can, you know, figure out for themselves if they're going to make a decision. As I mentioned, you know, this is for a particular patient, uh, so what are the implications for them? You know, if we've learned something about themselves and, and their life um, and how, you know, treating the condition is going to impact their life, we have to also share, you know, the implications for that particular patient and learn from them why it's important. And then lastly, you know, exploring their, pep their preferences. So after they receive the information or processing it, uh, they may have certain preferences of, well, I'm not a pill taker. I'd rather, you know, try to work on lifestyle, you know, instead to treat my hypertension. Whatever the case may be, you want to try to understand their preferences and help to, you know, get to a decision. All right, so I think in understanding, you know, after we've disclosed the information, really important to make sure that um, we assess comprehension. Uh, and the ways that you're going to, you know, disclose the information is going to influence the patient's ability to understand it. So hopefully you would uh, go through this slowly and clearly. You shouldn't just sort of rush through, you know, risk benefits alternatives uh, very quickly. Um, you need to give enough time so the patient can hear the information and process it. It's best if you use non-medical language, so don't use the medical terminology. If you do use it, then try to define the term. Um, if the patient has used their own terms to describe their condition, uh, good to use those because you know, that's going to reinforce the patient's understanding. Always helpful to use analogies, so wherever you can sort of uh, paint a picture for a patient uh, through the use of analogies, uh, that might help to aid their understanding. And even just, you know, actually drawing pictures, you know, so uh, if it's, you know, a surgery and you're proposing you know, uh, surgery on their liver, you know, describing or actually drawing a picture of the anatomy of the abdomen and where the liver is and what you're intending to do. And I'll be helpful for the patient to understand what the surgery is going to entail.
And a lot of people might have difficulty with numeracy or um, you know, not understanding numbers, uh, so it's best not to use probabilities and percentages, but try to use numbers clearly. Um, so say one out of 10 rather than 10%, for instance. You know, make it understandable so that the patient could uh, comprehend it and then have that as useful information. And I think a very useful strategy is something called ask, tell, ask. So you first ask a question, uh, try to explore what the patient already knows, uh, then you tell uh, some information, and then you ask about the, the information that you've shared. So it's a back and forth. And as you see, it's ask, tell, ask, which means uh, more weight is placed on the patient talking rather than the clinician talking. So in the, in the old days, the informed consent used to be just the disclosure of information, sort of a soliloquy by the physician. But in this case, with ask, tell, ask, you're really trying to engage the patient in talking as you're you know, disclosing the information. So how would it work? So the first ask would be, well, what do you know about your condition or uh, this proposed treatment? Maybe they've had prior experience with it. Maybe they've had a family member that's gone through a similar thing. So they might already have some background knowledge, and that's going to aid, again, in their understanding. If they're unaware of something, then you give them uh, a certain amount of information, a chunk of information. It shouldn't be a long list of things. It should hopefully just be in chunks, so short segments that they can then process. And then you follow that up with an ask question. So what do you think about what I have said? Or can you tell me in your own words what I've said? That's a way that you're going to make sure that um, they are you know, processing it and you know, using their own, own words or own language to describe it. And it's important to recognize that this is an iterative process, so it's a, you know ongoing back and forth. So you explain the concept, you assess their comprehension. If they don't get it quite right, then you might clarify the details. Uh, then you reassess their comprehension. So you're continually trying to um, reinforce their understanding. And it's also going to be helpful in terms of adherence to treatment in the future. So if it is prescribing a medication, the better they understand it up front and what's required, the more likely they are to adhere. Or if it's a surgery or a procedure, you know, what do they need to prepare for, what they need to go through after the procedure or surgery. Um, all of that's you know, an iterative process to get them to an understanding. And just recognize that every contact we have with the patient is an opportunity to reiterate information, reinforce information, to really make sure that their decisions are informed and voluntary.